Okay, and today's presenter is Paul Reese, um, and Paul has over 25 years of urban forestry experience at um, state, local, national, international, nonprofit, and academic level. So he's an expert in all genres of urban forestry. Um, he currently teaches urban forestry and arboriculture courses at Oregon State University as an instructor and extension specialist in the Oregon State University College of Forestry. He also manages the State Urban and Community Forestry Program for the Oregon Department of Forestry. He serves as a lead incident public information officer for wildfires and all risk incidents and is a member of the board of directors for the International Society of Arboriculture which is a nonprofit professional society with 20,000 members worldwide. He holds a master's degree from Ohio State University and is an ISA certified arborist. And with that, Paul, you are welcome to take control. Thank you, Leslie. Good morning. All right. Oh, I appreciate being with you uh, this morning. And uh, what I hope to do today is to give you some insights on how uh, your tree board could be more effective than it is right now. That doesn't mean it is not effective now, but there's always room for improvement as the saying goes. But I want to actually tell you that the material that I'm going to present today doesn't really just apply to tree boards. I'm going to be talking about uh, things like organizational development and group dynamics that really apply in any situation we find ourselves in when we have to work together with other people. And let's face it, that's urban forestry. I tell my students at OSU there's there's three things that it takes to, to effectively manage or run anything, and that's money, people, and partnerships. And tree boards really have a lot to do with people and partnerships, maybe less so with money, unfortunately. But uh, what I hope to really do today is sort of cover some concepts that will help you think about the organizations that you're a part of, whether it's a tree board or whether it's a, a city government or a state government or... Um, this could really apply to, to any particular workings that you find yourself a part of. So my outline for this presentation uh, today is we'll talk about what that word effectiveness really means, what it means to be effective. Um, we'll look a little bit about the, this whole concept of seven habits, which I've borrowed from uh, Stephen Covey's, uh, the late Stephen Covey's popular book series. You've probably heard of that if you haven't read that book. Uh, that book came out in the late 1980s, I believe, is when I first read it, and uh, there's several uh, uh, sequels to it. Uh, but we'll talk about this whole idea of seven habits and kind of borrow from, from Covey's ideas a little bit there. And then we'll talk about how can we apply this whole concept to tree boards. Uh, obviously, we want to be highly effective people, but in this case, we're talking about how do we, as a group of people, become more effective. And then finally, we'll talk about where do you go to get more help if you want to go sort of beyond the topics that we're covering today. So let's start off with this word effective. What does it really mean to be effective, or what does effectiveness mean? You know, one way to look at it is that, that effectiveness has to do with our ability to get things done or to accomplish things and to have an impact. And let's face it, as humans, we all desire to have an impact in the things that we're doing. Otherwise, we probably really wouldn't be doing them. So effectiveness to us looks like getting things done. It looks like having uh, work accomplished, being appreciated for that work, and making a contribution. In our case of a tree board, it might be um, effectiveness might mean having a contribution to what makes our city livable. Now, I want to make sure that we understand that effectiveness is not the same as efficiency. Um, being efficient means um, doing things right or doing things well. Effectiveness means doing the right things. So the other analogy is you could be very efficient at climbing a ladder, but if you put the ladder up against the wrong wall, you're not being very effective. So efficiency is really a measure of process, and it's a measure of, of how well you can do something, but effectiveness, on the other hand, it has more to do with whether you're doing the right things and how successful you are at that endeavor. So what are some reasons why tree boards might be less than effective or, or less effective than they could be? I think a couple of, of items that we could talk about on, on this um, area. 
One would be sort of a, a chronic lack of recognition or support by the city council or the staff or whoever really establishes the authority for the organization that we're talking about. It can be personal frustration of, of the uh, tree committee, the people that are involved. It could be weak leadership or, or disorganization. Or it could be poor group dynamics, and that's really what I want to hone in on today. Now, I realize that there's a lot of contributing factors, and your situation is going to seem very unique to you, and some aspects of it, of course, will be. Others will be, you'll find, will be in common with other people. But when we talk about group dynamics, um, those are somewhat universal. So when we talk about the problems that people have, you know, getting along or getting things accomplished, there's some commonalities among uh, organizations really across the board that we find to be uh, rather similar. So what do we mean by group dynamics? Well, first of all, we need to talk about the fact that all teams are groups, but not all groups are teams. The idea behind this thought is that you could put a group, bunch of people in a room together, call it a tree board, call it a church council, call it a city council, whatever, um, and those people are going to work together. They're a group of people, and they may or may not successfully work together as a team. So a work group is a, a group of people who share overhead, let's say, in pursuit of particular task accomplishments, whereas a team really works to achieve a common purpose, and that's a fundamental difference. So in order for a team to accomplish more than a group of individuals can, they have to work together effectively. That's where this whole idea of group dynamics come in. In other words, there are a set of factors that come into play when people work together. So if Leslie and I are working together on a, on a project, Leslie and I have known each other probably for a good 10, 15 years, we probably have a, a, a pretty good familiarity with how each other works. So we start at a different place than if uh, one of you on the on the call here, on the webinar here, um, comes and works with me on a project and we don't know each other, there's a certain amount of time that we have to sort of build that dynamic of working together. So the idea of group dynamics here is we want to, to um, really promote the idea of teams. Now, as I said, almost everything we do requires partnerships or committees or teamwork or call it a task force, whatever you want to call it. But the idea here is that we realize that through a lot of research that teams are more effective than groups. And tree boards are really one of the common forms of work teams in urban forestry. Now, I realize in your community it might not be called a tree board. It might be called a urban forestry commission or it might be called a beautification committee. Whatever it's called, I'm using the term tree board rather generically um, to, to basically talk about advisory or authority boards that work with city governments to help advance the cause of urban forestry in that community. You could have this at the state level as well. Some of you might be a member of a state urban forestry council. Same thing. All of these concepts apply in, in those arenas as well. So why would teams be less than effective? Well, there's a whole lot of reasons for that, and you can see them listed on the screen here. No two causes of dysfunction are going to be exactly alike because a number of these items that you see on the screen here, and I'll let you read them rather than me read them to you, but a number of these work in tangent with each other. So, you know, if you're, if you're in, a, in an organization or a group or a tree board that has a poorly defined mission, for example, I'm guessing you're going to have a lack of direction and clear goals as well. And if you have a, um, a meeting that's poorly run, it's probably because there's no accountability. So you see the, the, the different items that I have here, they're not meant to be independent of each other. They're not meant to be standalone. They're just meant to be illustrative of the type of things that we see when we work with organizations. And these are not meant to be uh, – you could probably see your group, perhaps, in, in one or more of these. I hope not all of them. That would be really bad. But – the idea here is that these are some things that you need to think about to take a step back and analyze, you know, why is it that our group is not as effective as it could be. So let's dive into that for a second. What exactly are characteristics of teams that work? Um, these items I'm going to talk about next have to do, uh, come from a, a gentleman named uh, Tom Champeau from the Effectiveness Institute. 
He's a consultant that studies these sorts of things. And he says there's six characteristics of teams that work. The first uh, is a high level of trust, that the members actually trust each other. They believe that each other has the, um, the other's best interest in mind or the group's best interest in mind. And that fosters a high level of respect, that people respect the other people who they're working with. Teams that work, if they work together, they have a clear and common purpose that everyone is committed to. Now, the way this can manifest itself in a tree board situation is, uh, let's say you're all voting to whether to spend money on something, and you've got seven people on your um, tree board, and five want to do it, and the other two are reluctant, and so you have a vote, five in favor, two and against. A team that works means that those two people who voted against spending the money drop their opposition at that point because the board as a whole has decided, yep, we're going to do this, and that they come on board. So it's a matter of um, it's a matter of people being able to come together in a common uh, situation and having that that clear and common purpose. Number four is conflict resolution. Now conflict is um, somewhat of a, of a dirty word or a negative word to many people, but in fact, in, in reality, conflict is pretty much unavoidable. It's inevitable. What matters is that we resolve conflicts rather than avoiding conflicts. Too many organizations and tree boards, um, they look at conflict as something to be avoided. If you can resolve conflict, you'll be a, be a stronger team in the long run. Number five is focus on measurable results. And I think the idea here is that um, you want to have something you can measure, something that you can call a success for your tree board. And, and these are things to really think about. Um, when I talk to, to groups and organizations, I'll, I'll often ask them a question, and they'll, I'll say, how many trees did your group plant last year? And they'll say, oh, we planted 100 trees. Well, great. That's a measurable result in one aspect. But in many respects, that's really an output. And what we're really interested in in successful teams are really outcomes. So if I'm going to ask you how many trees you planted, you might tell me 100 trees we planted last year. That's an output. But what I really want to know is how many of those trees survived and how many of those are, trees are providing the uh, economic, uh, environmental, and social benefits that accruing to your city. So that's an outcome, right? The idea here is that the number of trees you plant is an output. The number of trees that you plant that survive and that are contributing to your community's livability, that's an outcome. That's a measurable result that you want to achieve. And then finally, mutual responsibility and accountable, accountability. And the idea here is that uh, successful tree boards, people, people on successful tree boards not only hold themselves accountable, they hold each other accountable. And there's a, a peer pressure, if you will, um, to be responsible and to be accountable. Um, and, you know, groups that, that don't have some of those characteristics like we said before, a hidden agenda, for example. You know, if, if one tree board member has a hidden agenda, they're using it as a, a launching pad for a city council run, for example, or something like that, just hypothetically. You know, that can cause some issues with the, the remainder of the, the, the people on the, on, on the team. So have to pay attention to those sorts of things. So those are six characteristics of, of teams that really work. The other aspect that we need to think about is cohesion, and the idea here is that if your team is going to work, you need to be a cohesive unit. You need to be a cohesive group, and there's sort of team cohesion, there's social cohesion, and there's task cohesion. So you might say we're a cohesive team, we work well together, but, you know, there's actually a social aspect of this, too. Do we actually get along? You know, is this somebody that you'd, uh, you know, spend a Saturday afternoon watching football or you'd go to a an art show with or, you know, whatever. You know, you want to have good relationships among the people on your team. And then you want to be cohesive around a task. And that doesn't mean that everybody has to work on the same task. It just means that you pick the right people that, that work together well to do the right critical tasks that are in front of your tree board. So there's several factors that influence or affect how cohesive a group might be, and those can be environmental factors, personal factors, leadership factors. They might just be the whole team dynamic factors. And, and being a cohesive group on a tree board is sometimes difficult when you have changing members. So we have a, a good tree board has uh, staggered terms, and so every year 
uh, one or two p people might be rotating off and one or two people might be ro rotating in. You know, you've got to do a good job of orienting those new people into this whole idea of, of uh, team uh, aspect. So one way to do that really is to sort of assess yourself and each other. And some of the type of things that you might assess in your tree board would be communication styles, for example, and, and learning how uh, each other communicates. Some people communicate better verbally. Some people uh, communicate better in writing. And, and, and there's no right or wrong in this. It's just a matter of finding what people would prefer to do. Um, and then the other one would be personality types. If you've ever done, perhaps some of you have done one or more of these personality type indicators. Myers-Briggs is probably the most common one. There's another one called True Colors, another one that I use called As I See uh, Myself. And the idea is that um, uh, these help you understand how you prefer to operate and the things that matter most to you. And it allows groups to understand each other a little better and get insights into how you can be most effective. So uh, assessing yourself and, you know, taking an introspective look at the members of your group, um, and you can, you can Google these, these different uh, uh, tools that, you ha that I have on the screen here, but th these will give you some idea of, of how you might effectively assess yourself to decide um, whether or not you're being effective and how you can be more effective by learning more about each other. So when we assess work teams uh, with some kind of, kind of questions that we want to ask each other, uh, the, right, the first question might be, are the right people on the bus? That uh, is a, a literal reference, a literary reference to uh, author Jim Collins. He's a management guru out of Stanford University out here on the West Coast. And uh, Jim Collins uh, uh, has an analogy that, that we're all driving a bus and we want the right people on our bus to get to the right destination. And so we have to pay attention to whether or not we have the right people working with us. And if so, we have the right people, are the right people in the right seats? You know, one of the things you might ha find yourself is somebody on a tree board and nobody wants to be chair, so you make someone who's chair who's maybe not that good with organizational skills. And maybe that's not the best thing for them. They would do great as a tree board member, but tree board chair, that may be more pressure than they want to take on. So the other idea would be, are they being trained? Are, is your work team getting uh, 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 train, training? And uh, you'll find I'm very big on training. I'll talk more about that as uh, this presentation goes along. But, you know, are you getting trained? And oftentimes we come to a tree board as a new member, and um, it, there's not an organized, logical way to sort of orient a new uh, tree board members into how the board operates, what's, you know, been done in the past, and so forth. So I think it's important that individuals on your work team have a clear sense of what's expected of them. And this m may sound strange, but it's a good idea for your tree board to have a position description. Now, I know tree boards are volunteer positions. They're not jobs, really. So why would we have a job description or a position description? Well, the idea, because of that, that even that position description, even if it's just one paragraph, it helps the new board members understand what are their expectations, how many meetings are they supposed to come to, what, are the, what, what reading are they supposed to do beforehand, um, what type of activities are they supposed to be involved with. So the idea here is that that, that position description gives them a tangible sense of, of what their expectations are. So those job descriptions, you know, really are, reflect their value to the organization. And then finally, um, the idea is that, you know, are your, are your people on your work team all in alignment? And the idea for alignment would be that, that everybody's sort of moving in the same direction. Again, the bus analogy. Everybody's on the bus. The bus is going in the same place. It's not going to five different places. So the idea for, for work teams would be alignment is a key to actually getting things done. In other words, it's an ingredient to effectiveness. So with that, that brings us to, that's the background material now, that brings us to this idea of the seven habits of highly effective tree boards. Now you can um, probably, uh, through, uh, through your own uh, study and listening to this, come up with your own seven. There's nothing magical about these seven. These are just the seven I happen to come up with uh, through years and years of working with uh, tree boards and through years and years of serving on nonprofit organizations. I went back and looked and discovered that I've been a, a board member or a staff member of at least one nonprofit organization uh, going back to about 1990. So 
Uh, it's been a long time, so I've seen a lot of different things, and these are just some observations that I would offer. So I'm going to cover each of these seven habits in the next uh, several slides and uh, give you a, some inclination or some thoughts and some insights on each one of them. So number one, they live their mission. I think that import, it's important for tree boards to have well-defined roles and expectations. They understand what a tree, the tree board is all about. Now, some tree boards have a mission to be advisory. Um, other tree boards have an authority mission. They actually maybe are ones that will adjudicate appeals for people that want to remove a tree and can't or whatever it happens to be. But you need to know what's in, your, what's in the authority of your organization. Now, this is often established by uh, ordinance or by city policy or whatever it happens to be. So there's some, probably some written documents that, that uh, explain what it is, is the mission and the limitations, therefore, of, of the organization. I think individual tree board members and the board tree boards as a whole also have a purpose that they can clearly articulate uh, in what I call an elevator speech. And the idea behind an elevator speech is that um, you should be able to explain what your tree board's all about in about 30 seconds of jargon-free, easy-to-understand language. In other words, if you get on the elevator with somebody and uh, the doors close and you push the button and they push the button and they turn to you and say, where are you going? You say, I'm going to a tree board meeting. And they said, what's a tree board? You want to be able to explain that by the time you get to the next floor. Um, in other words, you know, 30 seconds or 25 seconds, whatever it happens to be, for you to get to the, to the destination. That's a, your elevator speech. It's a clearly defined uh, set of, of, of word sentences that, that describe you and what you're all about that people can understand, and really that leaves them wanting to know more. So uh, an important piece of this would be that, that they understand what it is you're trying to tell them. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, um, the last part of habit one, I believe, is that they understand the circles of influence and circles of concern. And, you know, let's face it, uh, if we're on a tree board, you know, people might just think we sit around hugging trees like you see my grandson here in this picture. Um, but there's really a lot more that we're interested in that we're involved with. And trees obviously uh, play an important role in the livability of our cities. So w what is it that we're concerned about and what, are we influence what do we have influence over? Well, this is uh, straight out of uh, Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He says that we all have a circle of influence and a circle of concern. And on the left side of the screen, you see what is actual. Uh, most of us have a big uh, circle of concern. There's a lot of things we're concerned about that we're interested in, but our actual influence is really rather small. So we might be able, interested in uh, world peace or global climate change, but we really have very little impact on, on sort of those bigger picture type of, of, of issues that are out there. What we really want to do, Covey says, is we want to move to the right side of the screen where we grow our circle of influence. That doesn't mean we are concerned about more things. It just means we have greater influence over the things that concern us. So what Covey would say is we need to understand that there's a circle of influence and a circle of concern, and we need to spend our time on those things we have influence over as opposed to just those things that we're concerned about. Habit number two. Habit number two uh, is that tree boards have a vision. They understand where it is they want to go, what they're trying to achieve as an organization. Um, and, and a vision is sort of that desired future condition of where you want to go. Now, you might want to say, well, we want to plant, uh, again, we'll go back to my tree planting example, we want to plant a 1,000 trees next year. That's really not a vision. Again, that might be a goal or an objective. Your vision should really be things like a healthy urban forest for our community or increased canopy covers that provide those, uh, those uh, ecosystem services to us. The planting of 1,000 trees is just really how you get there. So a um, vision is understanding where it is they want to go, what they're trying to achieve, and, and really understanding the limitations uh, in getting there. So if we want to get to a, a healthier urban forest in our, in our town or city or village, we need to understand what the limitations are. Maybe they're financial, maybe they're political support. Uh, maybe their organizational support, I don't know. But the idea here is that there are limitations that we all have on our visions. So our visions need to be realistic. I mean, if I have a vision to be the king of England, you know, I'm probably not going to really do that in my lifetime, or really any lifetime for that matter. So you have an idea. Those vi that vision has to be achievable, has to be sort of big, big, bigger picture. So habit two also 
is illustrative of the fact that people know where they're going and why, and they have a plan to get there. So why do you want a more livable city? Well, because a more livable city brings in more residents or more economic growth or it's just a nicer place to live. Why do you want a healthier urban forest? Well, because then we'll have cleaner air or cleaner water. So you want to have to understand that plan of how to get it is how to get to where it is you want to go. That means really strategic planning. I think the most effective uh, tree boards have an understanding of what it takes to plan for um, what comes next or what types of things they're doing at, at any given time. That means they have a long-range plan that has all those planning elements. Um, they have an annual plan of work that essentially is a roadmap for um, uh, determining uh, what gets done, but we need to also understand that your short-term plans need to be flexible enough to allow you to be opportunistic. So, for example, let's say you have this plan to plant um, 100 trees every year for the next 10 years in your city, and uh, that's being, you know, that might be a very admirable goal. Well, someone comes along and says, you know, I've got all these extra trees, a nursery owner, I've got all these extra trees I'd like to donate to the city. There's a thousand trees here. Can you take them? You, know, you really ought to be able to, or be in a position to be opportunistic enough to take advantage of things that come along, even if it's not in your plan, or even if it's in your plan but you're not supposed to do it this particular year. So don't let your strategic, your strategic plan straightjacket you. Allow it to be your guide, but also allow it to um, d direct where it is that you want to go. Habit number three, I think that tree boards that are most effective use their time wisely. Remember, tree boards are comprised of volunteers, and as my, my friend Mark Smiley says, volunteers have time to give, not time to waste. And so it goes back to the idea of, of helping a tree board be effective by being organizationally um, superior, let's say, or being organized in a way that people feel their time is being valued. So I think the most effective tree boards spend their time on things that are important, not just things that are urgent. If you were to look at, if you were to look at the um, amount of time you spend in meetings, you'd be shocked probably at how much uh, time of your life you spend in meetings. Um, studies have shown that managers, for example, spend 25 or 30 percent of their day in meetings. 75 percent of people have little or no training on how to actually conduct a meeting. And meetings are very expensive. They take time and money. And, you know, if you're dealing with volunteers, they may not be costing you, but it may be costing you um, in, in other ways, I mean, because you're spending people's time. So if you uh, – because tree boards spend a lot of time in meetings, that's what tree boards often do, is they meet uh, monthly or quarterly or whatever it happens to be, it's important that those meetings are run, run very well, run effectively, in other words. So what makes a meeting bad? Well, here's some ideas on the screen. You could probably generate your own list. Here's my list. Starts late, ends late. There's no agenda. Everybody talks at once. Nobody talks. And, or one person does all the talking. Um, these are just some, some things illustrated. Now, there could be other factors. The room could be, uh, you know, the room could be bad, uh, too hot or too small or, you know, whatever it happens to be. But the idea here is that you want to think about what you don't want if you're going to be effective to understand what it is you do want. So what makes a meeting good? A meeting that starts and ends on time, that accomplishes something, that sticks to an agenda, let's say, that allows for everybody to participate uh, in, an important, in a valuable way or a way that they feel that their opinions are value, valued. And then finally, I think a good meeting makes you look forward to the next one. And that's a hard thing to say about most of the meetings most of us go to, I believe. We're kind of like, glad that's over. But you really, if you're going to be effective, your organization should think about um, how, to, how do we, what do we get done next and be, and be looking forward to that, that situation. So it's your meeting, lead it. You know what it is you want to accomplish. Keep things on time and on track. Uh, if you're cha the chair of your tree board, encourage participation. Keep it balanced. Make sure that everyone is participating. And then seek uh, feedback for improvement. I don't think there's any one of us that's in a, in a group that says our meetings are, are run just perfectly and, and don't have room for improvement. Finally, in this area of meetings, uh, think about what you're spending your time on. Uh, I would 
venture to say most of us spend our time on the urgent, what, what I call firefighting here on the screen here. Um, but you really should be spending not so much time on that. Meetings should really be for looking at your goals and making sure that they're being achieved and, provide, and dealing with those maintenance things like the budget or, or policy that have to be addressed. And even should have a social component. I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually pretty big on, I think it's great if people bring food to meetings or if sometimes you have a, a meeting that starts with dinner, let's say, for example, because it's those social times that really strengthen that cohesiveness that I mentioned earlier. So think about the, the next, the last meeting you went to and uh, just spend a moment and visualize where did you spend your time? Did you spend your time arguing about really small stuff, sweating the small stuff? paying attention to the minor details, or were you looking at the bigger picture? Were you trying to set a course for your organization? <clears throat> Number four, they keep one eye on the future. I think that the most effective tree boards understand what projects come next, what people come next. They're cultivating project volunteers to become program contributors. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you have a, a tree board that routinely does tree planting projects or you have an information booth at the fair or, what, or at the city fair or the art fair, whatever it happens to be, that your group has volunteers that help and those volunteers come out on a project basis. They may come out to, help to plant trees or to staff an information booth. How do you move them from that individual task or that project to the overall program that you're trying to do? How do you make them become contributors to the bigger picture of what it is your organization's about? This is an important thing to think about. You want your volunteers to be long-term volunteers, and you want them to volunteer for more than one thing. You want to think about who comes next after you. If you're on the tree board and have been on it for a while, you know, start to think about succession planning. Who's the next person that ought to be uh, on our tree board. And what about youth? How are we outreaching to youth? I'll talk more about that in a moment. But it's important, I believe, that organizations involve the younger generation. Some of my research in, into this area of tree boards, and I'll have a, I'll have an, an article coming out about this probably uh, sometime next year or the year after, um, shows that our tree boards are rather old in general. Our, our the mean age is, in, from what my research has shown, is the mean age of tree boards is, is is up there. And, you know, a lot of people who are retired, they have time to volunteer in their community. That's great. But we really need to pay attention to the youth as well. And we need to be training uh, people to be on our tree boards and to be effective contributors to that organization. One way to think about this is that uh, in, in this graphic here that you see on the screen is that your tree board sort of in the center there. And you've got uh, people who are not on your board but might be on your committees or might be, or not on your board, but might be your advisors. And then outside of that, there's a larger group of people who, who support you, um, maybe financially, maybe just uh, um, appreciate what you're doing. And then finally out there, there's people who know you, and that might be a bigger group. The idea with this graphic is, for so people who are on your tree board, you want people to come onto your tree board from one of those inner circles, from your committees or your advisors, people who are already in sync with what you're trying to do, you don't want to bring people onto your tree board who just know about you because your learning, their learning curve is going to be tremendous. By that same token, this works in reverse as well. So when someone rotates off your tree board, you don't want them just to go out to that outer ring of being your supporter. You want to keep them around as an advisor or as a committee member, for example. So the thing I want you to think about with this is strategically who's on your tree board, where do they come from, and where do they go after they're on your tree board. Habit number five, they seek to make connections. I think the most effective tree boards connect their cause to other city issues, whether that's livability, economic development, safety, whatever it happens to be. I think we've spent a lot of time in urban forestry over the years trying to make it about the tree. It's really not about the tree. It's about what the tree does for us. My friend and colleague, George Gonzalez, is the city forester for Los Angeles, California, and I heard George once tell me that, tell us that he doesn't plant trees. Well, that sounds kind of crazy for a city forester to say he doesn't plant trees. He said, I plant atmospheric improvement devices, because what's the big issue in L.A.? It's smog. If he can get people to understand that he's planting trees in order to deal with smog, he's making that connection. I think we also need to connect with other people outside of urban and community forestry who can who help, convince, who 
help advance the cause that we're trying to, to make in, in our cities. We also need to effectively use social media. And that's a, really a new thing that I think some of us don't get used as, don't use as much as we could. Particularly if we're going to outreach to younger audiences, social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or YouTube, whatever it happens to be, these particular tools are the communication tools of choice for a younger generation. And if we're going to reach a younger generation, we're going to have to effectively use uh, social media, and that will make us a more effective tree board. Some of those urban forestry connections, I think we need to think about how urban forestry connects to things like economic development or community livability. Um, and, and quite frankly, I think there is a there's a, a, a center, there's an overlap between all the what, what we sometimes call the triple bottom line of sustainability, economic, environmental, and, and social or community. Urban forestry really fulfills all those goals, and I think it's as as a as a subject, I think it's under underappreciated and underrepresented at the table when we're discussing some of these these concepts. So. Effective tree boards then help make the connection between urban forestry and tree planting to everything else that's going on in their city. Habit number six, they value process as well as product. Well, what does that mean? That means that capacity building activities are just important as those outputs I talked about before, like tree planting. You can plant trees, but you can also plant ideas, and you can do that through things like having a board retreat, a strategic plan, and those can really have as much benefit to uh, to a, a group, to a tree board, as, as planting trees does. My perspective on this particular habit is that, that you should really be thinking about what comes next and thinking about on down the road. I believe that the most effective tree boards have an annual retreat. Now, retreat is a really lousy word. It means usually to go backwards or to, like, run in the other direction. In this context, we would usually use retreat as the idea of, you know, setting some time apart to discuss things, maybe having a longer board meeting, maybe going overnight, maybe, you know, having some group activities, whatever happens to be. That's kind of what we call a retreat because we're retreating from daily life. But it really ought to be called advance. Because why do we have retreats? So that we can advance the cause of our organization, so that we can spend time on those things that are important, like strategic planning. So I recommend that all tree boards have at least one advance. You can call it a retreat if you want. I'll call it advance. They have at least one advance every year, and that advance might be a day-long meeting. It might be a Saturday. It might involve a, a social activity as well. But it's not time that's designed to be spent on the things that are urgent, but the things that are important. It's not designed to be spent on things that are short-term. It's really designed to be spent on things that are long-term. I think that effective tree boards, if they're into this idea of, of process, that they, are, they value friend raising as much as they do fundraising. Now, yes, it takes money to do urban forestry projects, but it also takes people. It takes support. So if you have a fundraising campaign, you ought to have a friend raising campaign right along with that. You want to plant ideas as well as people, or trees, ideas as well as trees, as I meant, and you need to cultivate people. You need to really cultivate supporter. Spending time on those, on building capacity for what you're going to do next is really as, just as important as what you're current, currently doing. And then finally, you know, you have to ask yourself, is your tree board working together? It goes back to that whole idea of cohesiveness and highly effective teams that I mentioned earlier. Every team that is effective, that works in these areas, cultivates certain group norms. Um, they avoid interruptions and, destruction and, and uh, distractions. They listen to each other. Now, you know, a lot of times we listen just so that we can speak next, but we need to listen to understand, and, and we need to be able to explain our reasoning and our intent. I would say that the most effective tree boards are somebody comes up with an idea, somebody else builds on that idea, a third person perfects it, it's not just one person's ideas. It's a group of people's ideas that have been continually approved, and they're actually achieving more than they could have if they had been working alone. You need to respect each other's opinions and viewpoints and use decision-making tools to help. Maybe that's consensus or that's making decision space. Maybe you need to bring in a consultant to kind of help you with these sorts of issues. But it's important that you be all be on the same page for that. 
Finally, number seven. thought I probably wouldn't get to all seven of these in time, but here we are. Seven, I believe the most effective tree boards desire to inspire others. They realize they can't do it alone. They must inspire others to act with them. Um, and that they have influence. In other words, they help people, they help get other people willing to help. They get them on the bandwagon, as it were, to promote community trees. So they reach out, again, they reach out to youth in their community, for example. So there's a, um, a story in the book Tom Sawyer that uh, is about uh, Tom having to uh, be sentenced in his view of having to paint, in this case whitewash really, Aunt Polly's fence. And um, as he's doing that one Saturday morning, his friends all came along and, you know, they're kind of taunting him. We'd call that trash talking today. And it's like, hey, you're working. We're going to go have fun. And, and, and Tom takes a look at the fence and he takes a look at his friends and he, and he gets the idea that this isn't work. This is fun. And his friends look at him and they, what do you mean? And he says, well, he says, I'm having the, this is, I wouldn't, there was nothing I would rather be doing today than painting this fence. Well, his friends take a look at that and think, well, Maybe we should be doing that as well. And Tom ends up collecting uh, tax, if you will, from his friends. He gets a jacks and an apple and and, uh, and and a pocket knife and whatever else. And his friends end up painting his fence while he's sitting by watching. So he's getting others to do the work and paying him for the privilege. Now, what does this have to do with tree planting? You need to find other ways to get people to plant trees for you. It's not just the tree board's responsibility to plant trees. You need to connect with other people and inspire other people and organizations and agencies and whatever it happens to be that want to help uh, uh, paint your fence, I mean plant your trees as well. And again, that means, uh, I believe, connecting to, to young people and get that, getting them involved with an environmental ethic of, of wanting to plant trees. So that is the seven habits of highly effective tree boards, at least in my book. Um, you might have seven different habits. That's fine. Uh, I would encourage you to think more about this. Let me tell you a little bit about some places to go get some additional help if you want to explore this. If you find your uh, your tree board between a rock and a hard place, as you see on the screen here, you know, there's nonprofit assistance organizations out there. Um, there's a great group called SCORE, which is called the Service Corps of Retired Executives. It's sponsored by the Small Business Administration, and, and they have folks that can, can kind of help with consulting roles for these sorts of things. There's, uh, you might be able to get help from your extension service or from your state urban forestry program. There's also a variety of online courses and webinars that are out there available for you to become more effective tree board members. One of those is called Tree Board University. I'll talk about that in a second. I also want to mention that, I, as Leslie indicated, I teach at Oregon State University. I teach... Uh, uh, an urban forestry class called uh, it's, uh, Forestry 350. It's an online course. You can take it wherever you're at. It's available fall and winter. You can um, send me an email. Uh, my information will be at the, at, the, at the end of the screen. I'll, I'll give you information about how to register for that. There's also additional webinars in addition to the one that, that we're doing here today, the Urban Natural Resources Institute, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Alliance for Community Trees have regularly scheduled webinars on, on different topics. So I mentioned Tree Board University at uh, treeboardu.org. This is a uh, online training resource. It's a it's an asynchronous course, which means you can do it whenever you want, start it and end it, take however long you want to. It's not uh, graded, although it does have some quizzes in it. Um, but it's an online training uh, resource for members of local tree boards, and it was a project funded by the U.S. Forest Service and the National Urban Community Forestry Advisory Council. And there are eight courses. Um, and uh, you've just heard a little bit of what's in uh, a couple of those courses, um, particularly the Community Forestry Planning one and the Getting Things Done course. But these are the eight courses that you see on your screen here, and they are all topics that would be useful for you to help move your tree board forward and become more effective. Each course contains a, 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 um, some text to read, a short video clip, some uh, links to longer videos, reading some suggested activities and a quiz. Uh, average time, it will probably take you between 16 and 40 hours to go through this course. So it's not, not a quick fix, but it certainly would be uh, useful to your tree boards. The other thing this is useful for, I believe, is if you get a new tree board member appointed by your city council, um, you should have them take Tree Board University before they come to their first meeting. It will be a great orientation for them as to how they can impact your um, group.
So, to wrap up, I would offer you some final thoughts. There's no thing, such thing as a perfect tree board or a perfect committee or a perfect nonprofit organization. These are really just habits that, that I think you should strive for to become more effective. And, and as I mentioned in my introduction, these are really concepts that apply to any committee, board, or organization to which we belong. So there's my contact information. If you'd like to drop me an email, um, both of my emails there, as Leslie indicated, I sort of have two half-time jobs each. I work for the Oregon Department of Forestry and then for Oregon State University. Uh, you can contact me at either one. Um, if you want specifically want some information about online courses, uh, the Oregon State that edu web address would be best. So, Leslie? All right. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, it was a great presentation. It's very useful for anybody who serves on any kind of board or committee. Um, but um, so now we've got time for some questions for Paul. If you wanted to expand on any of those habits or if you have any specific questions pertaining to your board, you can, might be able to provide some suggestions on on how to best uh, remedy any kind of situation, or if you have a question, or that kind of stuff. Go ahead and post it on the Q&A tab, which is in the top left of your computer, and I'll read it out for Paul to um, respond. We've already had one question um, submitted, Paul. Um, this comes from uh, Jamie. He says that explaining reasoning is, and intent is huge. We have a community in my state that believes that tree, <laughs> the tree board it's part of a large international secret agenda to control communities through trees. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this opinion stems from a city council member, which makes things much harder. As strange as it is, the council would rather avoid the struggle to believe otherwise and decide to dissolve the tree to the USA status. Um, if you have any tips to display um, and help support tree board members, uh, he's all ears. So I don't know. Wow, that's, that well, that's a tough one, Jamie. There's several layers to that particular question. You know, I, my experience with Three City USA over the years has uh, has been, uh, I mean, I have, I have actually heard that um, government conspiracy theory before. I don't quite understand it, and I don't quite understand what the basis of it is, but, but I've actually heard that before, so it's probably not an unusual idea to me. But um, But I also think that Tree City needs to be a sense of community pride as well. So, you know, one of my examples is I went into a city one time and, and the city, the mayor of the small town had called me up and said he wanted me to come visit him and talk to him about urban forestry and I did and he goes, you know, I was in this neighboring city which he named and, and I, they have this Tree City sign that I was driving in and I can't believe they're a Tree City. What does that mean exactly, you know? And, and you know, he was envious of their Tree City sign. So I explained it to him, you know, and gave him some understanding about what the program was all about and, and how it's really just a, how it is a recognition that, that he could earn and that, and, and I'm not above using community envy to, to stimulate people to become three cities. So that, that, I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. <laughs> so, um, I, I kind of encourage that angle. The other thing that I think I would, would help you understand is that, that obviously the city manager, the city counselor that maybe is fomenting this sort of opinion, doesn't understand the the role of um, of community involvement in his in his city. So I think that it would be useful to find who find one of those unofficial power brokers. Maybe it's a former uh, city councilor. Maybe it's the mayor's mother-in-law. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's the wealthiest person in town. I don't know. Find that that unofficial power broker in town. Get them involved with uh, urban forestry and tree planting, and get them on your side. And that might be something that would sort of sway others to say, well, if they think trees are okay, that must, must be okay, you know. Every city has these sort of unofficial power brokers, and so I think I'd search those people out. Oh, great. Thanks, Paul. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions out there. I want to give people some chance to post a question if they would like. Um, but just while we're waiting, maybe give a couple, people a couple more minutes to post a question. Um, just to reiterate, I know Paul meant, you mentioned the Tree Board University, and just for those of you on this call, um, our Tree Board webinar series has kind of used Tree Board U as a uh, kind of a foundation point or starting point for our topics, um, just because we know that it is time intensive, to that you know, that 15 to, to 40 hours to complete all the sections of Tree Board U is, is a little bit of a... Um, 
of a commitment, which is great, but so all of our presentations that we've done in the past and we will do in the future are kind of looking at Tree Board View and some Arbor Day Foundation um, tips as, as a starting point. So these are all kind of precursors to Tree Board View. So if you find these webinars beneficial, um, Tree Board View would be kind of a natural next step in, in developing your board and, and making it be effective and functioning and that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, and I would encourage you, and I would encourage you to, to to think about that. And the nice thing about Treeboard University is you could do it whenever you want to and however long you want to take uh, for it. But these these webinars certainly are good you know, appointed time things. And the next one coming up with with Pete Smith covering tree ordinances that's going to dovetail just perfectly with Treeboard University as well. Okay, great. Um, so, all right, I don't have any other questions being posted. Um, you did a wonderful job, Paul. Thank you so much. For, um, for presenting, and thanks to all the attendees for participating. I hope you were able to glean some tips um, that you can take back to your board to, to have a more effective meeting and, and develop some vision for your board. Um, I also just wanted to bring up that we do have one more webinar in this, um, in this year's Treatment Webinar Series coming up next month, December 16th. Um, we're going to have tree care ordinances and tree protection ordinances being covered. Um, for that topic, and right now we've got Pete Smith from Arbor Day Foundation as the presenter. Um, so if you haven't registered, please do. We'll get you on board for that one. It's going to be another, um, I think, worthwhile topic that tends to be a little bit overwhelming for people. So we hope to see you there. Um, you've got my the web address there, ncusc.org. That's where you go to register. Um, and my contact information is on the bottom of this slide. Um, there's my email and phone number, so if anybody has any questions or concerns, you can always contact me, and I will get back to you um, with a response to your question or inquiry um, at a pretty timely response, I hope. So with that, everybody, thank you for coming and attending, and we hope to see you next month. Thank you, Leslie.